All right, so let's get started. Good evening, everyone. We'd like to welcome everyone to the challenging parathyroid case discussion hosted by the American Association of Endocrine Surgeons in collaboration with the Endocrine Society. I'm Julie McGill from Emory Healthcare in Atlanta, and I'm one of tonight's moderators. Hi, I'm Tom Connolly. I'm the, uh, the second moderator who will be working uh, with uh, our excellent panel that we've assembled to discuss some really challenging uh, parathyroid cases. We're lucky to have such a, a good group of um, uh, folks to help us work through these cases. Uh, this discussion tonight will be recorded and will be available for you to review uh, late after the event on the AAES um, YouTube channel. Uh, as a request, we would prefer that you keep your uh, devices on mute uh, during the uh, session. Um, we do encourage you to ask us questions and we would uh, direct you to the chat section to send those questions. And at the end of each of our presentations, uh, yeah. we will re um, review those questions for you. We are going to start by getting to our panelist. First up is Dr. Dolores Schoback. Please tell us a little about yourself and your background, Dr. Schoback. Thank you so much, Julie. I'm an endocrinologist at UCSF in the San Francisco VA uh, in San Francisco and delighted to be here tonight. Um, parathyroid disorders are a, a special interest of mine and it's really great to be together with endocrine surgery colleagues because we work together so, so very closely on the management of these patients. So thank you for having me. Wonderful. Next up is Dr. Shoni Silverberg. I thank you, Julie, and thank you to the rest of my ex my co-panelists. Um, I'm delighted to be here as well. I'm a professor of medicine at uh, Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons, uh, where I am the clinical director of the Metabolic Bone Diseases Unit and medical director of the Parathyroid Center, along with an esteemed member uh, of the AAES, um, Dr. James Lee, who is my surgical counterpart. Uh, next up is Dr. Cord Sturgeon. Uh, thanks, Julie and Tom. Uh, it is quite an honor to be on this distinguished panel. Uh, I'm Cord Sturgeon. I'm the uh, Chief of Endocrine Surgery here at Northwestern University, where I've been for about 18 years. I did my training at UCSF, uh, where Dolores is now, uh, and uh, about 50% of my practice is parathyroid. And our last panelist is Dr. Lynn Yip. Thanks so much, Julie and Tom. I'm so honored to be part of this panel uh, tonight. Um, so thank you so much. Uh, I am Chief of Endocrine and Breast Surgery here at University of Pittsburgh, um, where I've been uh, for about 12 years since I finished my fellowship. I'm so excited to talk about the cases. Awesome. All right, well, thank you everyone. And uh, with that, let's get started with these cases. Awesome. Our first case is a 71-year-old woman who presents with progressive bone density loss, fatigue, body aches, and bone aches. She has a past medical history of hypertension, anxiety disorder, GERD, and osteoporosis. Her home medications include amlodipine, doxepin, meloxicam, pantoprazole, alendronate, rosuvastatin, and cholecalciferol. Um, her initial labs show a calcium of 9.0 with a parathyroid hormone of 152 with a normal creatinine and vitamin D. Dr. Silverberg, would you start us off and um, tell us what you make of these labs? Uh, you're on. I'm sorry. I'm okay. sorry. Yeah. I am now unmuted. Okay. Um, to my way of thinking, the diagnosis uh, for this patient is uh, very uncertain. Um, the PTH is high. Uh, the serum calcium is, is really low normal, um, not even mid-normal or towards the upper end of normal. Um, so the first diagnosis that comes to mind uh, in, in my mind is not primary hyperparathyroidism, but instead um, secondary hyperparathyroidism, both because of the low normal um, calcium level and the fact that the parathyroid hormone level is significantly higher than we usually see in garden variety primary hyperpara. Um, it is of course possible that she has normocalcemic primary hyperparathyroidism, 
But one of the labs that is missing um, in uh, the presentation here um, is an ionized calcium level, which would be uh, absolutely mandatory in order to make that diagnosis. And um, she also came with these urine labs, which showed a 24-hour urine calcium of 135 milligrams. And she had a urine volume of 1484 with a random creatinine of 81.5. Dr. Schoback, would you comment on her urine labs? Absolutely, sure. So what we, the reason we do this is we're, we're looking for sort of low levels of calcium in the urine that might suggest a reason for the secondary hyperpara that I think this patient has. Maybe she is malabsorbing um, and, or, and or she has a very low calcium intake and then the urine uh, calcium will be low in those circumstances. Now hers, I consider sort of anything between about 150 to 250 as being within normal range. So hers is a little bit on the low side. It's not it's not marked hyper, hypocalciuria, low urine calcium, and obviously it's not hypercalciuria. So she's got a, a lowish urinary calcium. And I'd be asking her you know, about um, uh, symptoms of malabsorption, uh, like frequent stools. I'd be asking her um, about her calcium intake. I'd be wondering whether someone told her you have a problem with calcium balance and maybe she's restricting her calcium intake. So I'd be asking those questions. One other thing that I, I would like to have here is the full 24 hour urine um, creatinine. And I did do a back of the envelope on this and it was about 1200 milligrams, which is probably indicating a good collection. Otherwise you might say, hey, did this lady complete a, tw a full 24 hour urine? But when we did the calculation for creatinine, it was fine. And so I think this, is, this does reflect an accurate uh, 24 hour urine. So I'd be, I'd be wondering about her intake. I'd be wondering about malabsorption. As uh, Shoni said, um, her 25 is fine. So she's, it's not vitamin D deficiency. I'd be, I, I looked at the med list. She's not on any drugs that lower urinary calcium like thiazides, for example, or lithium. Those are things that we think about when we see a lower urinary calcium. So those are all things I, I think about uh, in a case like this. Okay. Um, She also came with this bone density report. And um, Dr. Schoback, back to you if you don't mind. Sure, sure. Interpret our bone density. Yeah, I mean, uh, so she's over the age of 50, and there we use the T scores to tell us whether she meets bone density criteria for osteoporosis. And, and you've made it easy for me because really at every site, she's below negative 2.5. So she has across the board at the spine, at the both sites in the hip, she's got osteoporosis. So she has, uh, you know, significant uh, bone demineralization. If I'm working up a parathyroid patient, I'm also often adding a, a distal a one third radius to uh, forearm measurements to the bone density, because that can be helpful. Here, it would probably also show low numbers, but in some cases that might be the only site where it's, where it's low. Okay. Um And this patient, when she was referred in, already had all of these imaging studies completed when she came to see you, Dr. Sturgeon. What do you make of this? Well, so uh, first of all, just to reset, we have a patient that our experts are both uh, not certain have hyperparathyroidism. And, um, you know, with the calcium 9.0 and elevated PTH and an osteoporosis, I, I see how people might uh, jump to that conclusion, but I agree with them that this is, this is something I'm not certain about. And one thing I would point out is this actually happens quite a bit that patients get these imaging studies uh, in the process of a workup and it's not quite even clear if they have hyperpara. And a, a big point I would like to drive home to the audience is that imaging studies like this, sesta scan, 4DCT, ultrasound, are not for the purposes of making the diagnosis or ruling out the diagnosis or ruling in the diagnosis. They are only for the purpose of planning a surgery. So I would say, um, Dr. McGill, I wouldn't order these tests unless I knew the patient had hyperpara and we were planning an operation. Uh, and if the patient really, really has hyperpara, I'm not dissuaded by negative tests like this. But I think um, 
the best to answer your question is that these negative findings do not change um, my thoughts about the diagnosis. Okay. And then, um, Dr. Silverberg, you said that you were thinking, leaning towards secondary causes. Can you go over some of the other secondary causes and then um, talk a little more about the importance of the ionized calcium? Sure. Um, so the most common secondary cause that, that we see um, doesn't apply in this, in this particular patient because we already know that her vitamin D levels are adequate. But in the world, the most common explanation uh, for a high PTH and a normal calcium level um, is, um, at least in the States, is vitamin, vitamin D deficiency. Um, and we, um, we've gotten that message out pretty well. Um, so people do treat vitamin D deficiency uh, when they see it um, to see what happens, whether uh, the PTH comes down or conversely, whether the calcium goes up. So one of the possibilities is that you have a patient with a garden variety hypercalcemic primary hyperparathyroidism who has vitamin D deficiency, which has lowered the calcium level into the normal range. And then when they're de-replete, the calcium becomes elevated again. What people don't often think of quite as readily as they do uh, vitamin D deficiency is what Dr. Schoback mentioned earlier, which is calcium insufficiency. Um, that is to say, somebody said, oh my gosh, you have a calcium issue. You better not have a bite of ice cream or of pizza because your calcium is going to go up. So um, there are people who are putting themselves on very low calcium intake um, and the PTH can be persistently high. Then we get into the realm of disease, more, more commonly recognized disease states, um, uh, CKD, chronic kidney disease. Um, some people are surprised to know that uh, um, even in individuals uh, with GFRs in the 40s, there is a component that not everybody has an elevated PTH, but some people do. Um, and certainly anywhere in stage three to five, you can see um, secondary hyperparathyroidism. Malabsorption is another big one, whether it's celiac disease, bowel resection, or more commonly um, uh, as a, a more modern uh, uh, iatrogenic issue, um, people who've had gas gastric bypass for obesity liver disease, and then finally, just to mention um, medications, um, uh, was alluded to earlier, bisphosphonates or denosumab, the oral bisphosphonate that she is on would be unlikely to cause the PTH to go up this much, um, but uh, IV bisphosphonates can, particularly in people who are not on enough calcium, and denosumab almost always raises PTH, um, uh, although probably not to 152. Okay. You, oh, I'm sorry. I also mentioned about the ionized calcium. So that actually um, is not, uh, does not come under the rubric of secondary hyperparathyroidism, but there are people who have normal uh, total calcium levels and um, elevated ionized calcium. There is no indication or no reason in a hypercalcemic hyperparathyroid patient to um, go to the expense and difficulty of measuring an ionized calcium. On the other hand, when the calcium is normal and we're wondering if this is normal calcemic primary hyperpara, that diagnosis can be made in individuals whose ionized calcium is level is elevated, um, uh, although their total calcium is not. Wonderful. Thanks for clarifying that. Dr. Yip, with this case, where would you go from here? Any final recommendations? Yeah, so I think this was a really great case because I see a fair number of patients like this, just like Dr. Uh, Silverberg said, most of the times their vitamin Ds are nicely replete, but they just haven't really um, had enough calcium. And so in this patient, I would definitely recommend that she take um, calcium uh, about a gram a day, uh, given her osteoporosis and her age and, and everything else about her, um, and then recheck labs uh, about two to three months and see how things look and go from there. Wonderful. Um, we have a few questions from the chat room. Tom, do you want to read through those? Sure. So one of the questions that I noticed um, uh, was out there is specific to PPIs and calcium absorption and how that may uh, play a challenge as we're making our diagnosis. I don't know if uh, one of our endocrinologists would like to weigh in on that, um, that question for us, please. Uh, I'll give a comment there. I think this level of PTH is pretty high for 
just a simple um, uh, proton pump inhibitor therapy. Uh, 150 is pretty high. Um, and many times it'll affect both calcium absorption and magnesium absorption. And there you often don't see the PTH go very high. So I think it's a bit high uh, a PTH for proton pump, but it's a good thing to think about because it may certainly affect calcium absorption. And that might be why the urine calcium's on the low side. And it might lead you, as Dr. Yip recommended, to give her um, to liberalize her calcium intake. It might lead you to give her calcium citrate instead of the carbonate because she won't have an acid stomach uh, to absorb the calcium carbonate with. Very good. Um, one of the questions I think we'll get to in a bit about genetic testing. Um, I, I think one question that has not been posed out there, but I think we all ask as surgeons is, is there a scenario that you would recommend a patient with true normal calcemic primary hyperparia? You've done your whole workup that you would actually recommend a surgery for. And maybe we could get an endocrinologist and a surgeon to weigh in if we have just a last minute or two here before we have to switch over. So um, I'll, I'll hop in for the endocrinologist's point of view. Um, I, I am loath to send people to surgery um, who have normal, normal, uh, normal calcium and hyperpair. Um, first of all, I often can't convince myself that there isn't a component of secondary hyperparathyroidism. And in almost all cases, um, the, the only um, manifestation, uh, end organ manifestation that counts is low bone density. And there are um, great treatments for osteoporosis that work in patients who have hyperpara. So I often treat, um, treat them. Having said that, um, there are we know that there are people with primary hyper, normal calcemic primary hyperpara who have adenomas, and when they're removed, the serum calcium goes down within the normal range. Um, the data are sparse in terms of the natural history. Some studies suggest that there may be an improvement in bone density afterwards. They can't, by definition, have marked hypercalceria because that would be an exclusion criteria because that's a cause of secondary hyperpara. And I will say that in the um, international guidelines that are coming up, there are at the decision ultimately among these 91 uh, panelists from around the world was that there are no guidelines for surgery in normal calcemic primary hyperpara. Well, there's our answer as surgeons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. I think that puts the nail on that coffin. Uh, Julie, I think it's time to move on to the next case. Perfect. All right. Okay, so case number two. Um, so we have a 66-year-old man who presented in the office uh, after a recent uh, parathyroid surgery. And he continues to have the same symptoms he was dealing with before his surgery with severe weakness, or excuse me, severe fatigue and weakness. Um, as far as his past medical history, uh, there was none of significance and he was not on any medications at the time of presentation. Um, so when we, um, with this uh, kind of patient, um, Dr. Surgeon, we went, um, went back and did some research uh, as we would wanna do as surgeons, but can you kind of walk us through your steps? Um, lucky enough to have these kind of information to find the, the old labs. You got some good lab, good folks working in your office. Sure. Uh, thanks, Tom. So uh, essentially, a patient comes in who's had an operation for primary hyperpara, but they have the same calcium that they did before surgery and the same symptoms. And, and unfortunately, we do see this quite a bit. And it, it, requires, um, it requires a fair amount of work to, uh, to do it right. And I would say bottom line is you got to start from scratch. The, the, what you want to do is obtain as much information as you can. You get the operative report from that operation. You get the path report from that operation. You try to identify notes and you look at all the work that was done beforehand. First and foremost, I'd say um, you want to make sure that the patient really has hyperpara. You know, go back and look and see how secure that diagnosis was before that operation because you'd be surprised sometimes that's the issue right there. And then um, afterwards, I actually find it really helpful to draw a picture of the operation. You read the opera note, you look at the path report, and you ask yourself what was and what wasn't found, what was and what wasn't taken out. And you know, oftentimes there'll be like biopsies and stuff like that, and you can you can essentially figure out what the patient um, has left in their body and what's really been taken out uh, based on the the pathologist. 
So that's kind of where I start. And then the next thing I do is I kind of redo everything, you know, so I recheck their labs. I, uh, in cases like this, where there's a failure, um, you want to try to understand why was it a failure because they had a very, very clear diagnosis and clear imaging. And they just couldn't find it. Or did they find all the parathyroid glands and they were normal looking or whatever it was. And I'll redo things like 24 hour urine calcium. And of course, if we're contemplating reoperating on patients, I would, I would love in a, in a perfect world, I'd love to have two concordant imaging studies before going back in for a redo. That's it in a nutshell. Thank you. So we did our research uh, and found an old op and path. And if you'll give us our next slide, please, ma'am. Um, actually, let's go back. We did see on the previous imaging that was non-localizing. We skip over that real quick. But the last imaging was non-localizing. We did get the, um, on the next slide, we have uh, the op and path reports. And so as we look through this, uh, we can see that they're, uh, through the report, the surgeon did identify four glands. By the report, they were told to be of relatively normal size, but the left superior seemed to be the largest gland. That gland was removed, and we saw did see a drop in the PTH uh, during surgery from 66 to 25 at the five-minute mark. On our PATH report, it did concur with what uh, the surgeon had seen. Biopsies were performed of all four glands, uh, with the largest being the left superior removed and a weight, as you can see. So, Dr. Yep, based on the information we have here, both on the how we dictate our operative notes, how we uh, interpret these path reports, can you weigh in and give us some thoughts on, on uh, how to proceed? Yeah, so I, it's reassuring to see that they biopsied the other glands. So I think certainly, as Dr. Sturgeon mentioned, um, even though the surgeon described seeing them, of course, we've all been wrong uh, before, even, you know, sort of the most expert surgeon. So it, it is nice and reassuring to see that they were biopsied and were, were confirmed parathyroid tissue. Um, and looking at the report, just really making sure that the description uh, matched sort of what you expect the inferior and superior glands to be, just to, again, confirm mentally that these are, these are truly um, parathyroid glands in the, in, the, in the correct anatomic position. So I think given that there were three normal glands, one abnormal and large gland, I would worry about sort of two possibilities. And so number one is again, reassessing the diagnosis, um, just really making sure that this is truly primary hyperparathyroidism um, as opposed to something else um, uh, like FHH, uh, which you would expect to see mildly enlarged glands, but uh, non-cure uh, postoperatively. And then um, again, I guess, if you were convinced that it was uh, primary hyperpara, that potentially um, this patient had a supernumerary gland somewhere that was missed uh, during the initial operation. Um, unfortunately, in a reoperative setting, uh, I would not uh, blindly go after a supernumerary gland that would require definitely positive imaging. So. Thank you. So we uh, did some repeat labs, um, as everyone mentioned, to, to try to figure out uh, the next steps. And uh, you can see those labs here. Um, we see that uh, still complaining of the same, uh, same symptoms. Um, and on the next slide, I believe we see that uh, we did get a 24 urine for calcium. And so Dr. Schovac, maybe you could help us walk through this, uh, these labs and maybe the 24 urine for calcium again. Absolutely. So when I look at this, I'm looking at the volume that's collected that looks uh, substantial. And then I'm also looking at the urine creatinine and that looks like it's a uh, it's an adequate collection. For men, I usually look for 15 to 25 milligrams per kilogram as defining what's an adequate collection for men. We don't have his weight, but that's what I'd be, uh, that's what I'd be looking for to make sure that it's adequate because the urinary calcium here is, lo is low. Now, what numbers do I use there? Well, kind of as a rule of thumb before I start doing any arithmetic, if it's less than 100, I'm starting to worry either. The calcium intake is very restricted or the patient has hypocalcuria. And this is a low urinary calcium, anything under 100. Then what's been shown from multiple series in different countries even, is that that calcium to creatinine clearance ratio, it's, the, it's that clearance ratio that you need to calculate. And you get a calcium on the blood and on the urine and a creatinine on the blood and the urine at the same time when you do your 24 hour or even your spot urine. If that um, clearance ratio is less than 0 0.01, I'm, it's hypocalcuria for sure, but I'm also worried about FHH there. There's plenty of overlap, however, and that's where you can get into trouble. Anything between 0 0.01 to 0 0.02 is definitely fair game for primary hyperpara, and anything over uh, 0 0.02 
is likely to be primary hyperparis. So you, it's a, there's a big gray zone. Uh, this patient lands below 0 0.01. So I'm thinking FHH, but I'm still wanting to be, uh, wanting to be sure. And there I'd be thinking in today's world, I need to do a genetic test to figure out if this patient is truly FHH because this patient has failed the first parathyroidectomy by an able surgeon. And so I'd be looking for uh, a genetic panel and a genetics referral where I could get the three forms of FHH uh, looked for in the genetic analysis. And that would be the calcium receptor, the G-alpha-11, and the adapter protein. So there's three forms of FHH we need to deal with now. And, and so we'd have to consider that in this patient. Thank you. So our next slide um, did show that we did have uh, genetic testing performed and did document a uh, mutation, the CASR gene. Dr. Silverberg, maybe you could weigh in on the, the role of, of genetic testing, when to order it and how to interpret some of those results. Uh, give us some direction there. So the question always comes up, we have a patient who um, has labs that biochemically look like primary hyperparathyroidism and has a very low um, urinary uh, calcium to creatinine uh, clearance ratio. Do we have to go any further? Can we just make this um, diagnosis based on, on, on the clinical presentation? And the answer um, in, in today's world is yes. Um, as Dr. Schoback said, um, there are up to 20% of patients with primary hyperparathyroidism who can have a calcium to creatinine clearance ratio less than 0 0.1. Um, and, uh, and many of our patients are, as Dr. Schoback suggested, in that in-between area. Um, and by the way, conversely, there are patients who have FHH who, um, who have calcium to creatinine clearance ratios above 0. Um, zero two, uh, about ten percent of, of of FHH patients. So you can't make it just um, based on the on the urine. Um, it's uh, um, and that's particularly because uh, in patients who may have low vitamin D or CKD, um, the urinary calcium um, uh, can be low. Um, the testing is now pretty much universally available. Um, but it is important to note that it is not universally, it should not be universally done. So there should be an index of suspicion before sending somebody for genetic testing. And one of the questions that um, uh, always comes up is this, is this something that's covered by insurance? Um, I know that some of this is state by state, but uh, in patients in whom there is a high degree of uh, clinical suspicion, we have never had any trouble getting, getting it covered. I suspect that if you had a patient with kidney stones and urine calcium of 380, I would hope that the insurance company or somebody would, um, would flag it and not, not necessarily do testing. Certainly, at least for FHH, they might do it for other um, uh, hyperparathyroid um, syndromes. Uh, I think that one of the things that's sort of interesting here, Dr. Schoback uh, mentioned uh, about the three forms of FHH. Um, I thought one form was enough to give me a headache, but it turns out that there are three different ones with three different genetic profiles. FHH2 almost uh, um, is very, very, very rare. Um, but FHH3 um, uh, uh, is seen in about 20 or 25% of patients. Um, and they actually do have more symptomatic disease. Uh, certainly this patient's clinical um, uh, complaints are not consistent with what most of us think about um, as the clinical syndrome of FHH, which is a very benign um, uh, clinical presentation with generally no complaints. Um, and this person has lots of body aches. Um, I will just mention that, um, that the fact that, that this person has an abnormality in the calcium sensing receptor, and we are thinking that maybe it's an FHH3, um, uh, is a little bit um, different from what we might expect. But I think that it does make the point that there is a fair amount of overlap, and also that even in patients um, uh, with garden variety, uh, old-fashioned FHH1, um, that in a certain percentage, the calcium sensing receptor um, testing is not abnormal. It's not necessarily because the calcium sensing receptor is perfect, but they only test for known abnormalities. So there are many abnormalities that they may not um, uh, test for. Uh, 
Awesome. Um, we have a few um, questions. One of the questions fits in with what we're talking about and said, is there any utility in doing the calcium creatinine clearance ratio in a patient who has a normal 24 hour calcium urine? I would, say, I, I would say, yes, it really does depend on the circumstances you're dealing with. If, for example, the urinary calcium is, quote, within the normal range, but the patient's failed a parathyroid exploration by uh, a good surgeon, and just this kind of circumstance where you feel comfortable that there's parathyroid pathology, hyperplasia, it's for gland, I, th I think you have to realize that there's a fairly wide gray zone um, for a minority of patients. And, and we, you know, you just can't get around that. So I think it is worthwhile, uh, even if it's normal. Um, and I've even had, I hate, to, I hate to admit it, I've even had patients in kindreds where there's definitely FHH1 and the proband had kidney stones and her father had kidney stones. So all bets are sometimes off, unfortunately. And what about, someone also asked, um, what if, you came back with the same labs, but your genetic testing was negative. I can, I can, say, I can comment on that. I think I agree with what uh, Dr. Silverberg said, which is that sometimes the calcium sensing receptor levels of gene expression may not be um, medi the, pro the problem may not necessarily be mediated by a mutation in the coding sequence of the receptor that gets picked up. It may be something like that. If the physiology and the biochemistry fits with FHH, um, it, it, could be, it could still be that, or it could be primary hyperpara where the patient just has a low urinary calcium. We definitely see that. So you have to make a clinical judgment in those cases, and those are tough ones. I agree with the questioner. All right, awesome. Let's move on to case number three. Um, this is a 51-year-old woman who presented with fatigue, weakness, body aches, memory issues, and polyuria. Her initial lab showed a calcium of 10.9 with a parathyroid hormone level of 35. Um, her past medical history is significant for hypertension, obesity with a BMI of 46, and type 2 diabetes. Her home medications include a combination blood pressure medicine, amlodipine hydrochlorothiazide, almostartan, as well as carvedilol, clonidine, metformin, and genuvia. Um, here are her follow-up labs. And Dr. Silverberg, if you can help us work through these, that would be great. It's showing the calcium of 11.2 with the repeat parathyroid level of 48. Um, so just to make a couple of clinical points, um, the main point that I want to make, uh, and if people take home no other message from things that I've said tonight, <laughs> let it be this one. Um, there is no such thing as normo-hormonal hyperparathyroidism. That's not a disease. So anybody who has uh, hypercalcemia, and in this particular patient, it's not even close, right? So this patient has a serum calcium of 11.2 and an ionized calcium that is very healthily ele elevated. Um, any normal uh, parathyroid hormone level is not normal because anyone who has hypercalcemia um, that is not PTH mediated should have a suppressed PTH level. So that's, that is the, the first take home message. This is routine garden variety, hypercalcemic hyperparathyroidism. Um, that, that's number one. Then the, the, the other sort of clinical points to make, um, uh, given what we've seen so far, I think someone is not on mute. I, could, I can mute myself, but it's, that would be a problem. Okay, <laughs> thank you so much. So um, the other um, sort of uh, lesser points to make uh, first of all, is uh, the fact that this woman is 51 years old. Um, so we, we see a, uh, a, a um, large proportion of patients uh, who are diagnosed within five to 10 years of, of menopause. Okay, listen to me. 
Come away. Thank you. Um, we see a large proportion of patients um, uh, being diagnosed with primary hyperparathyroidism within five to 10 years um, of menopause. And the way I always think of it, which I, is actually quite simplistic, um, is that the est estrogen is, was, was keeping the calcium in the skeleton. And when estrogen is, is gone in the postmenopausal state, the calcium um, uh, is able to come out more readily of the skeleton and the patients become hypercalcemic. So that's, that's the first thing to point to make about her age. The second point to make about age and primary hyperparathyroidism is that the extent of elevation oh, of PTH that we expect varies with age. Yeah, so uh, the upper limit of the normal range. No, 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 see, 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 that that we usually see that that patients that who are um, uh, older. Yes, yes, yes. Claro, claro, claro. Someone's sí. having a much better time than we are, I think. <laughs> anyway, um, so uh, Gino Segre from Mass General um, used to uh, say that the upper limit of normal for PTH at the age of 45 should be 45. Um, and so if someone has a, a PTH that is significantly higher and is quite young, the 51 year old is, is, is not quite, quite there, um, that, that may be inappropriate for their age. Um, and uh, I think that that was, oh, the, uh, the, 20, the urine. Um, this is a pretty marked hypercalciuria. Um, it looks like uh, it's a pretty complete collection. Um, both from a volume point of view and a creatinine point of view. And so I would look at this person and think just on the basis of lab values alone that this patient um, makes meets the criteria for a referral to an endocrine surgeon for treatment of her disease. Perfect, thank you. Um, this was her bone density study that came with her. Dr. Schobeck, would you pick through this with us? Sure. So uh, you can see the, uh, that she's had the spine and the sites in the hip measured, and there she's barely osteopenic. Only at the spine is she osteopenic. That's uh, a T-score between uh, negative 1 and negative 2.4. And at the other sites, she's actually maintained her bone density. But at the forearm, I think you can appreciate that she's two standard deviations below a young normal, uh, and that's what the T-score means. And so this, the forearm is a site of almost pure cortical bone and parathyroid hormone does demineralize cortical bone even more readily than it does trabecular bone like the spine. But I think this is a, a clear cut situation where that particular site is very helpful. And you know that she's had PTH excess, even though the levels aren't terribly high for her parathyroid hormone, she's had PTH excess chronically and it's affected her cortical bone. Wonderful. Um, at this point, we started to get localization studies. We started with an ultrasound, which did not show an adenoma. And at the institution of this patient, she they had a um, 4D parathyroid CT protocol, and it did show something um, above the isthmus. And um, no other potential sites were seen, no ectopic sites were seen. Um, Dr. Yip, what do you think about, and here, this is the picture of what it shows. Dr. Yip, what do you think about the imaging studies? And then also what would your operative plan be if you're gonna take her to the OR? Yeah, so first of all, I just wanna reiterate what Dr. Sturgeon had mentioned earlier that imaging um, results don't necessarily um, make or break the diagnosis. So we've already decided that this patient has um, primary hyperparathyroidism associated with osteopenia, um, and she has reasons to undergo um, surgery based on her 24-hour urine calcium and also her serum calcium too. So I think, you know, this patient's going into surgery and regardless of whether or not that imaging study is positive or negative, um, I would schedule her and get her set up for surgery. Um, the, the This location for a parathyroid lesion is a little bit unusual. Um, something above the isthmus is, is highly odd. Uh, I think I would be a little bit skeptical about that result um, and basically just treat her as having negative imaging um, from the beginning. Um, I think the one thing, uh, we always do our parathyroid uh, surgeries with intraoperative PTH. 
So I think in this situation, she'll probably um, start at a pretty low level, um, which always begs the question of where are you going to end um, to ensure that you've cured this patient. Um, and, I, and I think uh, for this patient with a fairly low PTH to start off with, likely in this negative imaging, likely she's going to need a foregline exploration. So I would plan and set her up for that uh, and prep her for that from the very beginning. And so, Dr. Sturgeon, going along with what Dr. Yip was saying, would you do you still think there's value in using the interoperative PTH? And do you have a target that you would be aiming for, or are you just kind of using it as a, a guide? What do you think about this patient? Yeah, I, so I think that we see this all the time where patients have preoperative uh, PTH values that you've reviewed, and you know, figuring out whether or not they have hyperpara. And rarely do those values exactly line up with what we see in the OR. You know, so if I if I had this patient, I wouldn't just automatically assume that IOPTH would be worthless. But I'm with uh, Lynn on this, where I would assume this is a non-localized patient, and um, I would not go forward thinking I'm going to do something focused or unilateral and use PTH. I would do a foregland expiration on this patient. I do have the ability of fortunate to be able to measure PTH and to measure it fairly quickly. Uh, and so we do measure it for all these cases. And um, I think I've been surprised more often than not that the intraoperative findings are a little bit more classic in patients. And, and you can kind of tell that you've had a significant drop in PTH uh, either from the, the pre-incision, the pre-excision value being considerably higher than what you've seen in the past. The other thing I would mention is that I agree also, Dr. Yip, this is a real funny place for a parathyroid. And, and um, one of the values of, uh, well, one of the things that I would do is I would probably do my own ultrasound just to see what that is. You know, I know that an ultrasound was done and they said, quote unquote, non-localized, but I think it'd be very helpful for the surgeon to know what that looks like before they start the operation. We may be dealing with some other pathology, for example, that you need to know about, maybe a thyroid cancer or something else. Um, and hopefully that answers your question. Tom, you want to look at the questions? You're on mute. Thank you. So um, I think one of the questions uh, that seems out there is what do we determine? What's a low PTH, an inappropriate PTH that's actually considered low? So you have a high calcium. Where, where's the cutoff? Is it 20? Is it 10? Is it five? Where would we um, call that? Dr. Silverberg? So, I mean, the absolute cutoff is the lower limit of the assay normal, which depends on, on the assay um, and on your laboratory. So a lot of people, it's 15 or below. I think that a value of 20 or 18 um, would, be consider, would be considered low, except, as I said, in a young person where um, we've seen primary hyperparathyroidism with, with real elevations in calcium and PTHs in the occasionally in the high teens and certainly in the low 20s. Very good. And then uh, the other question I'll ask um, uh, Dr. Schoberg, um, there's a question about how do you determine an adequate creatinine collection? If you could define that for us. Sure. Um, I use the, I use the uh, normal ranges of 15, milligram, 15 to 25 milligrams per kilogram body weight. If somebody is extremely obese and there's a lot more fat than muscle mass, then you might need to modify it a little bit. Or conversely, if they're very muscle bound, then you probably are looking for 25 milligrams per kilogram. But that's the range I use, figuring that women typically have less muscle mass. So I accept 15 milligrams per kilogram as kind of an average amount of creatinine that they should be excreting. And then I, that helps me determine that the collection, re, almost regardless of the volume, is adequate. And then Very one good. last question on this case. People asked, if the cestamibi is negative, what percentage of the time does the CT end up helping you and giving you a localization? I assume that's for one of us, me and Lynn. Yeah, I mean, I don't, um, you know, again, coming back to the original point, which is that imaging is helpful, but it's certainly not the make or break. So I don't usually get multiple different types of studies for these surgeries. I'll get an ultrasound to assess the thyroid and make sure there's no thyroid pathology. 
um, and then to also look for the paras and then for, and get assessed to maybe and that's pretty much the, the extent of the type of imaging that I'll get pre-op um, but if those are both negative and the diagnosis is secure I'm not going to get another study uh, for localization purposes so I don't I don't know the answer to your question unfortunately so uh, yeah I think it's entirely dependent on who does the first study um, there are some institutions with a lower um, you know accuracy of maybe they're never called positive even when we might look at them and think they're positive actually. So uh, in our, we have a large referral from us, from community hospitals. And if there's a negative sestamibi uh, and I repeat it, um, uh, it'll turn positive about 60% of the time. That's a rough and unpublished number. But frankly, I kind of do what Lynn does. Um, I ultrasound them myself. And if I find the the obvious, you know, sonographically obvious parathyroid. I don't put them through multiple repeat imaging studies. Uh, so I, I think that, um, you know, it is entirely dependent on the facility and how frequently they do sestamibi and all of that sort of stuff. I, I kind of reserve the 40 CT for those people who I feel like really need to be localized and have uh, negative conventional imaging such as sestamibi and ultrasound. Great, thank you. All right, Tom, case four. Sounds great. So if you'll get us the next slide, please. Sorry. That's okay. Okay, so uh, this is a 34-year-old uh, uh, lady who presented with uh, 14 weeks pregnancy and an elevated serum calcium level. Uh, as you can see, she didn't have any significant uh, past medical history and um, no family history that was significant. Uh, at her young age uh, presentation, and uh, she's only on a prenatal vitamin. Um, so, based on um, based on that, uh, the uh, the next slide, please. So here's some additional labs. Um, we can see that her calcium was 10.6. Her PTH was 116. Uh, kidney function uh, is normal, normal thyroid function. Um, and we uh, see that she has a low vitamin D level at 16. So Dr. Silverberg, maybe you could uh, give us some thoughts on how to proceed at this point. So the, fir the first thing to um, remember uh, is that normally uh, in pregnancy, serum calcium, uh, total calcium goes down. So um, patients' uh, serum albumins uh, go down in pregnancy and actually it's a pretty early finding. Uh, and so that normally uh, the serum calcium follows suit. Um, so when the calcium is frankly elevated, it's really frankly elevated. So there's really no question about what's going on. So this lady has clear primary hyperparathyroidism in pregnancy, not of pregnancy. It's not a disease caused by her pregnancy. She just happens to have it at the same time. Um, uh, one thing that um, has changed in terms of uh, our, our management um, is that, that we now follow most patients who are pregnant and have primary hyperparathyroidism successfully and uneventfully through their pregnancy. And that um, may well be uh, associated with the fact that the disease as it presents, at least in the, in the US, um, is milder than it used to be. And so uh, in the old days, uh, when the diagnosis of uh, primary hyperparathyroidism was made in pregnancy, the serum calcium was often very, very elevated and, and the uh, disease was more severe. Now, if you have patients who have calciums in the mid tens, they generally do fine. Um, and the fetus also generally does fine. So, so surgery is not the default option um, for patients who have primary hyperparathyroidism in pregnancy. On the other hand, there are um, uh, uh, cases where surgery is the appropriate uh, response, and that would um, be anybody who had a threshold calcium that was more than one milligram per deciliter above the upper limit of normal. So in the lab of this patient, it would be 11.2 or greater. Um, of concern in this particular patient in evaluating her labs um, and in terms of her management is the fact that she is very vitamin D deficient, not just sort of. Um, uh, she's very vitamin D deficient. And um, as I uh, mentioned before, uh, this uh, relatively profound vitamin D deficiency may be lowering her serum calcium uh, to 10.6 rather than it being at 10.6. So we would want to know what happens uh, 
um, uh, when her vitamin D is a little higher before a decision is made to operate or not to operate. Thank you. Well, next slide, please. So we did uh, go ahead and repeat the uh, replete the vitamin D and, and repeated some labs. Um, next. And so here are the results we have now. So Dr. Shobak, could you help us uh, with maybe thoughts on vitamin D replacement um, and, and uh, how we can proceed at this point? Sure. So and maybe even comment on how this calcium affects uh, the baby at this point. Okay, sure. So um, she had her vitamin D repleted. What I would probably do with the level of 16 would be to give her 50,000 units of D3 once a week, perhaps for four weeks and start her on a very low dose replacement. I'd do this very gently because she's already hypercalcemic. I'd probably check her calcium labs two weeks after I started that just to make sure I didn't really um, raise her calcium uh, dramatically. So I'd very gently replete her. And it looks like she was repleted and her calcium went up substantially. So, um, and her PTH really didn't change uh, all that much. So, so the diagnosis is still clear cut but she's more hypercalcemic than she was before. And I assume we have a, a vitamin D level of at least something in the range of 30 nanograms per mil. So she's right at the beginning of her second trimester. And this would be a time I'd be notifying my endocrine surgery colleagues about this patient and, and probably considering, given that level of um, calcium, uh, uh, considering localizing her and, and taking and recommending uh, surgery. What, what this might do to the baby, it's, it's not severe or dramatic hypercalcemia, but what it might do is suppress her own, her baby's parathyroid so that when the, if we left this alone, and so that when the baby uh, was delivered, the um, neonatologist taking care of that baby would need to watch that baby carefully for hypocalcemia. So sort of delayed parathyroid function in the baby. That's what I'd be concerned about. Thank you, Dr. Schoback. Next slide, please. So um, now we uh, have a patient who's been referred to surgery um, and we have to talk about imaging options. So Dr. Sturgeon, maybe you could give us some direction there, please, sir. Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I want to just echo something Dr. Schobeck just said. This communication between the services is so critical uh, uh, that we're aware of the patient. We, we want to operate in the early first or the early second trimester. And they want to achieve a relatively normal vitamin D and everything. So I really appreciated that comment. I think that really is essential. We're all on the same page. We're moving to the same goal at the same pace. Um, you know, obviously with hyperpara, we're always talking about imaging and trying to figure out where things are. Um, but in this pregnant patient, I would probably just do ultrasound. And that's all I would do. I don't want to inject her with a radiopharmaceutical, nor do I want to give her a contrast load, nor a... Um, you know, a CT scan. I know we can shield the abdomen and all that stuff. So we certainly do CT scans for appendicitis all the time. But, you know, frankly, I think uh, ultrasound is going to give me the information that I need. Uh, it's non-invasive, it's painless. And I would, I would probably, no matter what it shows, do it again myself uh, so that um, I've got the surgical plan uh, pretty clear. Very good. So here's our ultrasound report. Uh, and if we can see the next slide, uh, and here is seen on the ultrasound. So, um, Dr. Yep, how would you proceed at this point? You've got your ultrasound, you've got your diagnosis, and your endocrinologist telling it's time to, to, to do a surgery. So I think the only other thing that I would add in her evaluation is that since she's a young uh, patient, I would really want to make sure that her family history um, didn't include anything that would concern me about MEN1 um, or any kind of inherited endocrinopathy, because that would certainly change the extent of surgery and certainly the management of her disease intraoperatively. Um, so that would be the only other thing that I would add uh, to her preoperative evaluation. But it looks on this ultrasound that she has um, a hypochoic uh, nodule um, on the left side. Um, it's labeled as left superior. Um, it looks like it's almost lateral to the to the um, lobe in that initial image. So um, I'm not 100% sure, but um, I, I think certainly I would start on the left side and plan to use intraoperative PTH um, to help guide uh, the extent of surgery. Is that her Very third? Good. Yeah, it looks like it's, yeah. Thank you. Um, next slide. 
So um, I guess back to the timing of surgery, um, Doctor, maybe you could comment uh, as far as the second trimester and um, the, the, is there a perfect time? And then maybe some post-operative thoughts if it's multi-glane disease and, and, and maybe how that affects uh, her, her management post-op. Yeah, so the second trimester, of course, um, as we sort of we discussed, it, it is the ideal time uh, to operate. I usually do have these um, pregnant patients see their uh, high-risk OB just to make sure that everyone's on the same page. Um, there is a risk of uh, pregnancy loss, and so I think it's very it needs to be very clear to everybody involved. Um, during this time, we would uh, usually check fetal heart tones pre and post-operatively, um, but again, there's not, uh, unfortunately, I usually counsel the patients that there's not much we can do if, the, if there is an issue with, with the baby um, during the early second trimester, um, but that is the safest time. Um, so we coordinate it with uh, high-risk OB. Uh, we make sure the patient is aware of implications. Postoperatively, I think that's one of the benefits of using intraoperative PTH is that, uh, especially in the case of four-gland hyperplasia, if we end up having to do a three-and-a-half gland uh, uh, um, uh, resection, that spinal PTH can sometimes be prognostic in terms of how likely is it that this patient's going to be hypocalcemic post-op, um, but I would definitely aggressively manage her calcium, put her on uh, replacement calcium post-operatively, make sure her vitamin D levels were adequately replete as we already did um, to really reduce the risk of hypocalcemia uh, after surgery. So, Thank you. Wonderful. We are approaching the top of the hour, and we'd like to thank everybody for joining us today. A special thank you to our panelists for their time and energy and expertise. And we'd like to thank the Endocrine Society for working with the American Association of Endocrine Surgeons to collaborate on this project.